How do we generalize the Lebesgue integral on R, as defined in our opening sequence, to the Lebesgue integral on higher dimensions, R to the K? Well, for K equals 2, we can visualize what we want the integral to do. We want the value of the Lebesgue integral of a nice simple function like this to be what we think of as the volume between the xy plane and the surface which represents f. Now just as in the case of one dimension, we can build up to functions like this from even simple functions. In fact, for any number of dimensions k, we can construct the Lebesgue integral and r to the k in exactly the same four stages. Namely, we can start off with characteristic functions of bounded intervals, step functions, then the limits almost everywhere of increasing sequences of step functions with bounded integrals, and finally, the difference of such functions. Well, in the case of k equals 2, it's very easy to visualize these four stages. And that's what we're going to do in the first half of the program. We're going to construct the Lebesgue integral on r to the k for the case k equals 2 by using these four stages. Now, in the second half of the program, we'll tackle the problem of evaluating the integral. And we'll find that there's a very useful theorem called Fubini's theorem, which relates the value of the integral in R to the k with the integral on lower dimensions. But first of all, let's look at our four-stage construction. The first stage, we have to talk about the characteristic function of bounded intervals. Now, what does a bounded interval of R2 look like? Well, that's easy. It looks like a rectangle. And we're going to think of it as a product of two intervals on the real line R. And I've got an example here. For this particular bounded interval in the plane, we're going to think of it as the product of the interval 3, 5 along the x-axis with the interval 2, 5 along the y-axis. Well, that's a bounded interval. Now let's look at a characteristic function. That's the function which takes the value 1 at every point inside the interval and takes the value 0 everywhere else. Well, what about the integral of such a function? Well, we've got it written here. And let's see how we get this expression. Well, the interpretation of the integral is the volume of this particular block. And the volume, as we know, is the height times the width of the cross here times the length. Now, for a characteristic function, this height is always 1. So that the volume of this, the integral, will be the area of this bounded interval, this length times this. And that's precisely what we've got written on the back here. Well, so much for characteristic functions. That's stage 1. Let's turn now to stage 2, step functions, which we know are linear combinations of these characteristic functions. For example, let's take this characteristic function and half of another one. I'm going to take half of chi 4, 6, 3, 6. And I'm going to add on our original characteristic function. And there you have a typical example of a step function in the plane. But what about the integral of such functions? What we do is a precise analogue of what happens in the one-dimensional situation. 
we take the same linear combination of the integrals of the separate characteristic functions. So in this case, we have the integral of this characteristic function, which is 2 times 3, which is 6, plus half the integral of this characteristic function, which is, again, 2 times 3, which is 6. So we get 6 plus 3, giving us the value 9 for the integral of this particular step function. Well, that's the end of stage 2. So the integral of this characteristic function is just the length of i times the length of j, the area of the two-dimensional interval i cross j. And for stage 2, the integral of the step function, which is just a finite linear combination of characteristic functions, is just that same linear combination of the integrals. Well, that's quite, quite easy. Now, what about stage 3? Well, just as in the one-dimensional case, we say that f belongs to L ing of R2 if it's the limit almost everywhere of an increasing sequence of step functions with bounded integrals. Well, these step functions were converging to that smooth function everywhere. But what does this almost everywhere mean? Well, just as in the one-dimensional case, it means everywhere except in a null set. But what is a null set of R2? Well, just like before, it's a subset of R2 which we can cover by a sequence of open intervals which, whose total area can be made as small as we please. And here we've got some examples of such null sets. One such example might be these three isolated points. They form a null set in the plane. Again, this finite line segment is a null set. And again, this unbounded line segment is a null set in R squared. Now, it's quite straightforward to show that each of these is a null set using the definition. And it's just as easy to show that the union of these three sets is a null set. The union of the sets can be covered by a sequence of intervals whose total area can be as small as we like. Let's look at a sequence of step functions which converges everywhere except on this line x equals 5. And let's suppose we had the original sequence of step functions, but this time approximating to a slightly different function. Here's the original function. But suppose that the function we're trying to approximate has a discontinuity along the line x equals 5. Suppose that along this line, the function does not have this shape, but is instead equal to 1. Now, if we look at the original sequence of step functions, they must fail to converge to this new function for all the points along the line except these two, where the new function coincides with the original function. So the step functions fail to converge to the discontinuous function at all the points except two on this line x equals 5. But we know that such a line is a null set in R squared, so even more so is the line minus the two points a null set. That is, the sequence of step functions converges almost everywhere to this discontinuous function. So that's an example of what we mean by convergence almost everywhere. And if we have that phi n is an increasing sequence of step functions, which does approach f almost everywhere, then we define the integral of f as being the limit of the sequence of integrals. And that's how we define L of R2. And then we make that into a vector space by taking the difference of such functions, and we define the integral of the difference of two such functions as being the difference of their integrals, exactly as before. Well, that's what we've done for R2. And in the case for Rk, it's just a very straightforward generalization. So that's the 
four-stage construction for the Lebesgue integral on RK. Well, what about evaluating such an integral? Well, I suppose you might try to use this four-stage process directly. Well, that would be rather cumbersome. Even in the case of one dimension, you remember we actually imposed extra conditions in order to enable us to use our old integration techniques. Now, we can actually simplify this problem by relating the integral on r to the k to the integral on lower dimensions without imposing any extra conditions at all. And that can always be done, and it's called Fubini's theorem. And we're going to illustrate that for the case k equals 2. And in that case, this is what Fubini's theorem says. If I have a function of two variables, its integral as a function of, of x and y, or r2, can be obtained by integrating first of all with respect to r, and then integrating the function with respect to r again. Well, I've put that very crudely, actually. I mean, what do I mean by saying I can integrate a function of two variables with respect to r? Perhaps if we look at the statement in classical notation, it will illustrate it a bit better. It says, if I want to integrate this function over r2, then I can do it by, first of all, fixing x and evaluating the integral of the resulting function of y with respect to y, and then integrating that function of x that I get with respect to x. And that's the, the import of Fubini's theorem for r2. Now, this color coding is rather useful, so I think we'll use it for the rest of the program. When I'm thinking of y as being the variable, I'll use black. And when I'm thinking of x as being the variable, I'll use white. And I suppose when we're just thinking of the integral over r2, we'll use gray. So it seems a, a fairly straightforward sort of theorem. There's actually a bit more to it than I've implied. So before we actually look at the proof, let's see an example of Fubini's theorem using Ian's model. Well, first of all, what does it mean to say to keep x fixed and think of f as a function of y only. Well, what that amounts to is taking a cross-section of our function f through a particular value of x. So let's take a cross-section of this function at x equals 4. This cross-section of f at x equals 4 has this range of values for y. It's a function of y. And what we can do is to integrate this function of y. And when we do, we will get a value. And we can record this value. And of course, we could do this process by varying x, taking various different values for x. For example, at x equals 8 and a half, the cross-section of f is the zero function. So its integral is zero. At x equals 7, the cross-section has some small positive values. So its integral will be positive, and so on. So that's how we get a function of x. And the theorem tells us that if we integrate this function with respect to x, the value we get will be the value of the integral of our original function. Well, there's actually a little technical detail which we need to clarify, but Ian will do that in a minute. What Ian has actually shown us is that there are really three parts to the theorem. Firstly, each cross-section is integrable. Secondly, when we integrate it, we get this function of x, which itself is integrable. And thirdly, the integral of that function of x is the value of our double integral. Or if we look at our commutative diagram, it says that this little function f can be viewed at in two ways. Firstly, as a function on R2, which we can integrate. Or we can also think of it as a set of cross-sections, 
For each x, we integrate it with respect to y, get this capital F, which we integrate with respect to x, and hopefully, and that's Fubini's theorem, get the same value of the integral. The commutativity of this diagram is really this last statement here, the statement of Fubini's theorem. Well, what we have to do to make sure that these operations of integration are legitimate ones is first of all show that for each x, this function is in fact integrable, as a function of y, of course, and that the resulting function capital Fx is integrable. Well, actually, this is where the small detail comes in. It won't be true in general that for each and every x, this function is integrable. However, we don't need that to hold anyway. The theorem is still true without it. So let's see an example of that. Do you remember this example? It was the same as the smooth one that we've been looking at, except along the line x equals 5, where it was defined to have the value 1. So when we take the cross-section at x equals 5, what we get is a constant function. And we know that such functions are not integrable. That means that we have no value, we cannot assign a value to the function capital F at that point. But of course that behavior can happen for many, many cross sections. But fortunately, all is well because the theorem tells us, or at least it occurs in the proof of the theorem, that the set of points where this happens forms a null set, a null set in R. And we know that such a null set does not affect the value of the integral. So where f is undefined, we can assign any value whatsoever, integrate the function we get, and what we will get will still be the value of the integral of our original two-variable function. So this is the more precise statement of the three parts of Fubini's theorem. Firstly, we have an AE here and an AE there. So the first part tells us that this function for fixed x is integrable as a function of y for almost all x. Not for all x, but for almost all x. That won't matter. When we integrate it, then we get a function which, a function of x, which itself is integrable, and it doesn't matter what values we assign it for the bad values of x, because the value of its integral will not depend on those bad values, and that value will be, and this is the statement of Fubini's theorem, the value of the integral in R2 that we were looking for. Well, that's Fubini's theorem. How do we prove it? Well, what's very nice about the proof is that we actually use the same four stages that we did in the construction of the Lebesgue integral. That is, first of all, we prove it for characteristic functions, then we prove it for step functions, then we prove it for functions in L inc, and finally we prove it for functions in L1. Well, we won't be able to go into all the gory details of all the four stages now, and God forbid we should try to do that. But at least what we'll do is we'll go into some detail for the first two stages, and Later on, I'll indicate the main ideas in the proofs for L inc and L1. So let's look at stages one and two, uh, characteristic functions and step functions. What we're going to see is that in those cases, every cross-section is integrable. So let's first of all look at the proof for characteristic functions. I'm going to use one of the characteristic functions I used earlier. This is the one where the x's go from three to five, and the y's go from 2 to 5. Well, let's do our slicing trick and see what the function capital F looks like. For any x greater than 5, the cross-section is the 0 function, which has integral 0 with respect to y. So capital F of x has value 0 for all x greater than 5 but for any x between 3 and 5 inclusive, the cross-section is chi of 2, 5, which has integral 3. And for x less than 3, the cross-section is the 0 function again, with integral 0. So capital F is defined everywhere. It is, in fact, a multiple of a characteristic function on R. It is, in fact, three times the characteristic function of this interval, which is the length of J, times the characteristic function of the interval I. So that when we integrate, what we finish up with is the length of J, 
times the length of the interval i. And that, of course, is precisely what he wanted it to be, the length of i times the length of j. Well, that's the theorem for stage one for characteristic functions. Now for stage two for step functions. What we're going to show is that when we have a step function here, then every cross-section is integrable, and the result of integrating twice with respect to r is the same as the double integral of the step function. First, let's satisfy ourselves that each cross-section is integrable with respect to y. The cross-section for each x is just a step function with respect to y. So each cross-section is integrable, so that capital Phi is defined everywhere. And by the linearity of the integral, it's equal to this. And we know what these integrals are by the stage one proof. Now, let's integrate small phi with respect to x, y. We saw how to do this earlier on. We get this expression. And if we integrate capital phi with respect to x, we get the same result. Well, that's the theorem for stage two. Now comes the hard bit. Now we have to prove it when f is an L ink. Actually, once we've proved it for L ink, it'll follow for L1 rather simply, simply by linearity, in fact. But let's look at L ink. We won't go into the details of the proof, but we'll build up a very suggestive diagram which will illustrate the main ideas of the proof. Essentially, what we do is this. F is an L-ink, so it's the limit almost everywhere of an increasing sequence of step functions. And its integral is the limit of the sequence of integrals. Now, we've just proved that the theorem holds for step functions. That is, we know this triangle is commutative. And to prove that the top triangle is commutative, it turns out that all we need to show is that these limits work. What do I mean by saying these limits work? What I mean is that the limits must work in such a way as to make the two rectangles in this diagram, this one and this one, commutative. And when that happens, it will turn out that this upper triangle will also be commutative. And that's just a statement of Fubini's theorem for L ink. Well, I don't have time, of course, to go into the proof of this here, but you'll find the diagram in your broadcast notes. And I hope that this diagram will help you as an aid to understanding Fubini's theorem.